Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, hopefully you guys can hear me OK. Let's see the clock's just turned uh, 930, so we'll make a bit of a slow start. But yeah, so yeah, welcome back to day two of the Force uh, Underexplored Plays seminar. My name's Rory Salmon, uh, and I'll be chairing the first half of today's uh, se seminar today. So first of all, um, just a big thank you to, to all the presenters and the organisers yesterday. They chaired the sessions for their uh, interesting talks from the presenters and and the uh, the nice segues in between talks from the organisers. And uh, yeah, and to everyone who attended uh, for their engagement and interesting questions throughout the day. So a uh, special thanks uh, to all those as well who hung on uh, for Alexei Milikov's presentation uh, at the end of the day yesterday. Apologies for the kind of timing mix up on that. We were caught out by some daylight savings changes, etc. But uh, we won't make the same mistake today. But uh, yeah, the talks have been recorded throughout. Uh, those that have approved have uh, been recorded. So we, those who missed it can always walk, watch uh, Alexei's presentation back. And I recommend those who uh, couldn't couldn't hang on, give that one a listen back. Um, yeah, for me, I, I thought Alexis' talk was super interesting, and uh, one of the interesting things he uh, mentioned was the industry's kind of consistent underprediction of geological chance of success uh, of the prospects. I thought that was quite a yeah quite the reflection from quite a large data set. So that's something perhaps we can all reflect on. Uh, and yeah, it'll be a kind of thematic in some of the talks later today. So hopefully that uh, sparks some interest there. So now on to the schedule, I suppose, for day two. Um, yeah, so we have an interesting day planned. So we'll start the morning uh, with a session on the optimization of the subsurface uh, with new technology. Um, and then we'll move on to before lunch, uh, a talk on the future of exploration. And then we'll have lunch at 12 for an hour uh, and then we'll resume at uh, one o'clock where Cecilia will take over and we'll have a session on uh, ch the challenging oils thematic. Um, yeah, but also just to note, uh, like yesterday, we, we've had a slight adjustment to the schedule. So um, Alexei Milikov's presentation will ta now take place at 4.15. So I hope everyone can can hang on till on till then, and uh, we'll close the seminar at five o'clock. So that means that we'll take in fact the summary and feedback before uh, Alexi's presentation. So a slight shuffle of the the um, schedule from what was posted online earlier. All right. So with that, I suppose we'll just move into the into the first session. So again, this is going to be on the optimization of the subsurface with new technology. And our first talk today will be um, held by Morton Sola from Horizon Energy. He will give us a talk on the need for cost efficiency in the CCS industry. So Morton is the head of subsurface and license acquisitions in Horizon Energy and has a background in geophysics. He has more than 30 years of exploration and production industry experience from across the world in various technical and managerial roles within several large oil and gas companies before joining Horizont. So uh, it's definitely well placed to talk to us about this subject. So, so Martin, the uh, virtual floor is yours and good luck with the presentation and I look forward to your talk. Thank you. I hope you can hear me and see me. <laughs> Yes, and I'm going to share my presentation. Uh, now you should see my presentation and we're all set. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> and also thank you for inviting us to this uh, force um, seminar. It's a um, good place to be and qu quite a few people listening. Uh, so that's good. Um, cost efficiency in the CCS industry. It's my title. I mean, one obvious uh, reason for that is that we are not a part of the oil and gas regime, so we don't benefit from the 78% tax back, as you in expression do. So um, we have to be very um, careful with, with the cost side of things. Just a few things in, in um, let me see that it's 
There we go. Just a, a few words about uh, the company to start with. I mean, we are a young company. Uh, we were founded in 2019, and this picture was shot in uh, October 20. Just a bit more than a year ago, we were 11 then, and now we are 25. Uh, we had no money then. Now we have uh, been founded by, by strong uh, investors, uh, the latest, uh, the E.ON entry. Uh, and we are a group of uh, people with uh, experience from the oil and gas industry. Um, we have uh, has a mis mission and vision statements. I mean, we 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 are going hard in on CCS and ammonia uh, production. Um, we we aim to be profitable. And that links to this cost um, uh, efficiency statement. Um, and uh, pluralistic. Uh, well can be defined in many ways, but we are not a one project company. You, uh, we, we, uh, you might have heard about the Barnes Blue project up in the north. We're doing more than that. We're also doing uh, third party uh, carbon storage in, in, uh, in the southern part of Norway, where we're going to take uh, CO2 from Europe, uh, ship it to Norway and uh, inject it in a um, carbon storage uh, that we are uh, developing these days. Up in the Barnes Blue, that's um, um, that's actually waste uh, CO2 from the ammonia plant that we are planning. Um, <coughs> the idea on, on the ammonia plant is to, to buy the gas, natural gas from Melkoya, convert it to ammonia and um, produce a million tons of ammonia per year per train of, of plant and then take the CO2 out to the Polaris storage. That is 2 million tons per year and that's also per 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 train. So uh, we're planning for between one and three trains. So actually we're planning the grounds for three trains. Uh, so that's that. I'll come back to that. The <clears throat> the ammonia is, is planned to be used or offered to the chemical industry, fertilizing industry, and, and the more up and coming uh, maritime fuel and power plant fuel um, uh, segments of the market. And uh, those are the two lat latter ones are, are the areas where we see or expect a huge growth in the, in the future. Here's a <clears throat> glimpse of the uh, a model of the um, of the of, of the plant. It's going to be a zero emission plant, a, a, a very modern and environmentally friendly one. Um, the CO2 capture. If you go to the lowermost right corner, you will see that the um, the uh, the uh, overall CO2 capture from this plant is more than 99%, and that gives us the uh, the mentioned uh, CO2 disposal. Let me also mention that we are now together with Vor Energy and Equinor on this uh, uh, Barnes Blue project, and also you might know have noticed that this ammonia plant was ranked as a uh, IPSE or. <coughs> A project of, of common European in, uh, interest uh, just before Christmas when we received almost half a billion Norwegian corner from the Norwegian state. Um, <clears throat> so the CO2 disposal of two between two and six million tons per year, that's the task we got in our hands. That's what the, the plant needs and what it must have to actually work because without the disposal of CO2, the plant doesn't deliver blue ammonia, which is what the market <coughs> uh, is requiring. <coughs> Sorry. So to, um, to, uh, to, to find the, uh, the right um, uh, uh, storage uh, place, we, we, um, we used uh, own um, area competence, but also uh, the NPD uh, CO2 atlas and uh, if, if, you, if you look at the CO2 atlas in the Barnes Sea and, and, and start with the prospect A, that's a good start. That's what we chose. The uh, reason for that is this, it's large. Um, it's a flat structure. I come back to what that means. And, uh, and uh, it has data and it has, it has seismic data and it has a, a well. And it has a brilliant uh, um, uh, reservoir, the Realgrund. 
Now this is uh, currently in uh, in uh, in application status, and and we call this structure now Polaris, the the, the storage. It's uh, application is submitted and received, and we understand from the authorities that the um, the uh, award process is ongoing and an award is expected this uh, first half of, of 22 and uh, and I can't say much more on that and, and because <clears throat> it's in in the application status there's a limit to how much I can say about it but you see the well you see the well is on the very almost on the very top of the structure here 1400 meters <clears throat> subsea and uh, you see also that the down flanks from there I have indicated an area where we're going to go for injection um, uh, and this is a very, very uh, uh, low gradient structure, so less than uh, all, uh, ab about half a degree of structure, which is very ideal the way we see it for for uh, storage of CO2. Um, I mentioned that we did some own studies. Uh, we used the DISCOS database here intensely, both to, to download 2D data and and uh, and uh, also what we could find of 3D data. I can come back to that. And also we had to buy some seismic here. Um, uh, and again, uh, buying seismic for us in the CCS business hurts much more than for in the oil and gas business because it's uh, it's 100% uh, uh, cost uh, all the time. Okay, we <clears throat> just a little bit of an example on how we we uh, we uh, plan to to uh, to inject. This is a just a uh, we utilize the CO2 atlas um, uh, simulation model here that we downloaded from the NPD well site uh, NPD website. Um, and here you see a one train scenario in a closed system where we um, uh, inject two million tons per year. Uh, and you can see how uh, the plume develops over the time in our model. And you can see that at 25 years, it's only uh, like uh, six kilometers uh, in, in, in diameter. Uh, and then when you leave it there, it starts to develop and it, it migrates slowly up to the uh, to the uh, top of the structure and start to fill up the structure. And at a thousand years, you have moved only between 10 and 30 percent of the CO2 that you injected up to the structure apex. The rest is trapped in the most a more safer way in residual or capillary trapping and, and also in the solu uh, solution uh, with the water. So most of, because of the time that it takes from injection point and up to the apex, uh, you, you, can, you, you can trap most of it in, in the s safer uh, trapping mechanisms. So, and I'm referring to the figure down the left corner that comes from the IPCC report of 2003. So that this sort of tells you a little bit about the, the um, the uh, how the uh, uh, migration of the CO2 that we have injected um, uh, occurs. I mentioned that we use the NPD model, um, but to understand how uh, the the the, um, the the pressure cell works. I mean, when you inject two million tons per year or even six million tons per year, you're going to move quite a lot of water around that you're going to push away. And the pressure you you uh, induce there is um, is immense. So you need to understand the stratigraphic development in a larger area. So we have de we're developing a large uh, geo model. Uh, you see that in red here. It's uh, significantly larger than the NPD model. It's actually quite significant when it comes to to scale of a, a geo model, and it's actually similar size to the southern part of, of Rogaland County <laughs> for comparison. That means that we need to, to build that in, 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 um, in a, a smart, uh, smart way and, and have such graphic information, we need to use the 3Ds that are available. Fortunately, we have the, <coughs> the edge of um, the competitive edge on which uh, continental shelf of having the disk or so that you can download 3Ds uh, that are available uh, therefrom. Uh, so here you see how we we have used the the adjacent 3Ds uh, into the uh, an information for that into building the model. So it's quite a lot of it's quite it's quite 
data intensive, you need to use a lot of data to build the right models that you, you need uh, for doing your modeling. Just a little example, I mentioned the pressure and here's, show, here's, a, here's a, just an illustration of how the pressure develops in your injection phase. You saw the closed system, that's the model I showed you. Then you just pressure up the cell and, and it stays there. When you have a large aquifer and, and not a closed system, and then you, of course you have a different pressure development over time and uh, also the peak pressure will also of course uh, then uh, be um, um, a, uh, a, fa a factor of how a large an aquifer you have and and how the the maximum pressure you can you can utilize is, uh, is of course steering how much you can uh, uh, the injection rate that you can use and we're going to use high injection rates so we need to understand fully understand um, the um, the uh, how much we can uh, how how the the large aquifer will react to to what we are injecting and then mentioned that um, the the um, the um, and you see and you understand that 3D data is is key for us. Uh, I mentioned that we we don't have the same tax system. We 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 it's 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 a hundred percent cost for us. There's no tax back. So for us, it's uh, the the uh, the date for for uh, for release of 3D is is key. And here you see, I illustrate this. This is from the NPD resource report, and you see that the. This part is, is going to be in the 2011 vintage of seismic is coming available this year. I mean, they, typically the 2011 seismic was re, was processed and finished in 2012, so that they, they're coming available this year. But all the large surveys that was shot uh, in the following years, and uh, they, they will also be of high value for the CCS business because of what I just showed. And, and um, uh, so, so it's a volume of 3D, but also the fact that we need most of the seismic uh, surveys that are there present for us. We need to we need to to crispen up because we are we do need a um, good reservoir characterization. So we ha we need high resolution, vertical and lateral. And good, of course, signal to noise is at the reservoir level, but also the overburden is much more important for us because we need to prove the the that uh, the the reservoir can take the uh, the um, the um, uh, the pressure we we induce, and that we have no leakage conduits uh, up to to sea floor. So so we we need uh, we need. Uh, uh, specialized. I mean, I, I compared to the 2011 uh, vintage um, uh, 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 processing, we need much more sophisticated processing. Maybe the later uh, uh, surveys that have been processed have more of the qualities that we need. Uh, so the need for reprocessing are not that um, uh, obvious on, 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 on the younger generation ones. I'm stating that it's less important with top reservoir structural subtleties, and that brings me on to this. I mean, the structural picture when you have, at least in this um, um, uh, scenario, it's not so important if you have small uh, f closures here and there. It's 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 it, and 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 small small adjustments to to the to the um, uh, to the gradient and so on. It's that's not the most important thing. So, for example, if you go into a, a PSDM that has been more or less standardized in the oil and gas business, that's that's a uh, that's that's I can see the reason for it in 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 a oil and gas business. But for us in the CCS business, it's not necessarily so important. PSTM might be enough, and we have to think the good enough um, uh, uh, thoughts all the time to keep the cost down. Now, when we have, we have, when we have, um, uh, or when we are injecting the uh, the CO2, and when we have done it, we need to monitor it. And that's uh, so. It's uh, just real on uh, real-time injection control and pressure surveillance, as I mentioned, but also uh, a temperature 
and we need to and to to monitor how the plume develops and so on. And we we can use many methods of doing that, but but the most costly is the seismic uh, method and the current uh, current day um, um, uh, um, seismic is is of course very expensive so we're looking into can we use less expensive methods and and fiber is obviously one that is, is good for us and if you remember the the small uh, plume development uh, from a, a previous slide we we believe that we can uh, we can cover uh, the the plume development and monitor the plume development for the full injection period let's say 25 years with just vertical uh, fiber in the well um, and uh, when you uh, when the um, the uh, plume starts to migrate you can then fill on with with the uh, seafloor fiber that is not as far come in in development as the vertical does uh, to, to and that will be also a a, 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 a fraction of the cost of, of traditional um, uh, 3d it's just an example of that tds and does have done some early early feasibility on uh, on this and um, as you see here, are some results from a, actually a, a, the bin. Uh, no, actually one of the injection well locations. And when you use uh, the multiples in in, uh, in, a, in a smart way, you can uh, get uh, pretty good um, coverage. And with several wells and overshooting, uh, you you can get a very good and sufficient um, uh, uh, coverage only by vertical dust. And if you look at the cost and resolution you see that it's very very favorable so so for all of if, if there are any guys in the audience working with with uh, with fiber methods this this fiber method is, is it has uh, i know that it's used in several places um, uh, and uh, i don't know how much on the norwegian continental shelf but also in the gulf of mexico it's utilized a lot uh, but the the seafloor fiber is has not that far come, and um, uh, but when you look at the time span, uh, 25 years uh, of injection. I mean, you're looking 30 years out before this project will need uh, uh, monitoring uh, se seismic monitoring that uh, that will require uh, seafloor. Um, uh, seafloor uh, fiber or cables or, or, or nodes or whatever you want to do. Uh, but we do realize that using nodes, uh, the, the classic nodes on seafloor, for example, will be too expensive for us. So we, 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 we say that um, the, the CCS is um, considered marginal. We say that because um, the, um, the, um, the uh, what is the market um, uh, willing to pay for getting rid of the CO2? That is, uh, that there's a lot of uncertainties around that. So when there's uncertainty on the on the uh, revenue side, we need to be very um, very um, conscious on the on the cost uh, side of things. If we go, if we accept the oil and gas level um, cost. Uh, that we, we just see that that we, we, we cannot live with that. So we have to, we stress that everything we do, we have to 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 to, uh, to challenge the, the cost level. Now, being in CCS business on Norwegian continental shelf is fantastic because of the uh, because of the discos. That's really a good um, good thing for us. And we also see that uh, to follow a little bit behind the exploration business and take use of the seismic that has been shot and the well data that uh, and the, the exploration wells that is dry, like the binner well I showed, can be very beneficial for us. And we can and we can also uh, learn from the the wisdom in, of the oil and gas industry. Um, the uh, I, 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 I brought up a point here where I'm stating uh, the discourse membership because I think and, and, uh, and having uh, being in, in force, it might be a good place to, to, to mention this. But today there is nothing like a CCS discourse membership and we think that it should 
should uh, we, we 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 would recommend to go in such a direction because as you see we need we need early access to data and uh, we need deep access we need actually uh, access to the to the field tapes as well so that we can do uh, the reprocessing uh, where we need it and and um, um, and also uh, the the interpretation uh, with 20 years of, um, of of protection of of, of interpretation is, is also something that we we uh, we would benefit from from lift that um, lifting that um, uh, restriction and again, but of course, we understand that there are uh, a lot of uh, wisdom within within the companies that they w that is a, a a an edge for them. And uh, but if there is a system where we can build a a um, a uh, experience and knowledge transfer to the CCS business and protect it so that it's not utilized by competitive partners within the oil and gas business, that would be very useful. And also, I'm I'm always um, uh, challenging the the um, uh, seismic processing um, uh, industry to 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 develop new business models uh, for for uh, reprocessing um, uh, seismic data, so that it 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 becomes affordable for for um, the. Um, CCS industry. Sometimes you can see that uh, maybe maybe the CCS industry is the initiative taker for a reprocessing, and uh, and by doing that, it, you can give new life to a seismic 3D that maybe has been on the shelf for a while, and uh, and uh, the the um, and can be again maybe attractive for uh, uh, for the oil and gas industry. So that was a little bit of a CCS uh, talk in the morning. Uh, we are again uh, the um, here is our um, uh, vision to accelerate the transition of uh, the carbon neutrality through pioneering projects, and um, that's where we are. And uh, we, as you, I've, you hope you have seen in the media, we are working hard to to do that. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Martin. Very uh, interesting presentation. I very much like your uh, comment on the kind of more uh, openness of data availability. I think that's a really important point in uh, terms of accelerating this transition. Um, yeah. So we have plenty of questions coming in in the chat, which is good to see. see that. So I see Jonathan Osman was in first. Uh, he had questions. Uh, his colleague Nora Holden is curious about the perceived fault seal mechanism for the prospect A. I assume. Yeah. Uh, are you able to go a bit more into that, or is it kind of uh, under the no. realms of application? No, but, but but I can say that I mean, of course, uh, there's a main fault there, and uh, and uh, that is a risk that, uh, that we have to evaluate the, the the leakage risk on that fault. Um, but mind that the uh, it will take 130 years before so, uh, about 20 percent of the CO2 reach that level, and also at that level in time, the pressure has dropped. To clo close to to what it initially is. So, but we are doing studies on on on, on the capacity of those uh, of those forts. Okay, thanks. And then we have a question from Eric Jualand. So I assume the injection are planned to be done in matrix mode and not in fracture mode. Is potential fracture propagation seen as a risk, and is it modelled or simulated as a worst case scenario? I, I I I must read that to understand the question. Propagation seen as. If you think about fracture propagation in the reservoir, then that could actually be a uh, a uh, an upside because you increase the the the, the capacity. Um, but but uh, so it's not seen as a worst case uh, scenario. But but uh, um, I think I think I, I I suggest that we you, 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 no I, I think that that's what I can say at at the at yeah. the moment yeah okay no problem so maybe we should think more on the the more uh, broad questions then so you don't <laughs> have to venture yeah, yeah, into yeah. the rails so then uh, in terms of there's a nice uh, question from Alejandro here so. 
what yeah. what's kind of been the public perception? Uh, have you had many challenges with the project's Absolutely. development in the north? And Absolutely not, not, not in Norway, but but I, I, we do get questions uh, from um, potential customers in uh, in uh, in in Europe, where and the, here's and, and and that's also why I use this uh, this um, uh, slide where uh, uh, showing how the uh, CO2 is moving and how much is really going, uh, how little is going into structural trapping. Uh, because there's a sort of almost a perception out there among non-geologists that uh, the CO2 is stored in a, in, in a balloon down there, <laughs> and 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 it and it can burst, and what happens then? So that that's now not how things work. But but I think it's 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 a question about I mean learning. I mean people understand how these things are done. There's there's a much more comfort with with uh, uh, what we're doing. Uh, so and, and typically, you, 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 for example, in Germany, it's not allowed to to inject uh, CO2 in the in the subsurface, uh, and of course that creates some 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 uh, uh, some perceptions around what this is. Um, so so, um, but uh, uh, the question is. Uh, uh, or, or the, to, to respond to the question, we have met a lot of uh, different uh, perceptions, uh, but it's about learning how this works, and then, then, uh, then uh, you get the acceptance. That's that's what we see. Good. Okay, and then maybe we have just time for one uh, one last question. So I see. Uh, yeah, I think one that will be in many people's minds. A question from Damien here. Uh, yeah, so we see kind of this CO2 ETS uh, in Europe going kind of incredibly high at the moment and, and things. And so there's a question kind of linked to that, I suppose, is do you have any kind of yeah ballpark tariff estimations per tonne of CO2 stored or kind of what, what you think is realistic with the development of a project like this? Yeah, I mean... Um... Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to go into to to details on that. But but uh, but you you you. We all see what is discussed in the, in uh, among politicians uh, in in the different countries, and um, and and we have our uh, opinion around that. And uh, um, I, I guess the customers. I mean, the, what 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 the the. the, the, the the CO2 um, um, tax or the CO2 what you, fee will be, it's, um, um, it's of course uh, directly linked to what we can charge. Uh, so, so um, um, the, the higher the CO2 tax, the better for us, for our industry, of course. But I don't, I don't want to go, go into to, to oh, no, exact, exact numbers. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> understand. <laughs> no, but thanks again, Morten. That was a really interesting talk, and uh, it's always I think, good to have you at four seminars. I think that's the second underexplored place. Is that right? But yeah. So thank you, and uh, we'll move on to the next uh, speaker then.